Good morning and welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. It's Sunday, September the 6th, and I'm thankful to have the chance to worship with you again this morning. As the new school year and our new program year begins, there are lots of ways that you can participate in the life of our church, even now. Just go to our website, faithpcusa.org, and you can find out ways. You can connect on Wednesday night in some small groups. You can connect with other groups through Zoom. There's just lots of things you can do, volunteer opportunities as well. So I hope you'll go and do that so that we can still stay connected during this time that we're apart. As I mentioned to you last week, we filmed these services during the week uh, before the Sunday upcoming, and as you might know, there is a lot going on in Tallahassee right now, from the beginning of school with all of its uncertainty, with also unrest downtown, unrest around us, and maybe even some unrest within us. And in the midst of all of that uncertainty, I always try to lean on those things that are certain. And what is certain above all else is that God loves us and God will never let us go. God calls us every single day not to be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good. And so with our hope in Jesus Christ, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. We are standing on holy ground. All those who have gone before us have witnessed to the love of God. We are challenged to be people of loving service. Lord, open our hearts and spirits to accept the call to serve you by helping others.
Trusting and penitent hearts, let us gather before the Lord to confess our sinful selves. Redeeming God, out of the flames of your creation, your voice calls, marking us as your own. Yet there are times when we choose to ignore your voice and listen instead to our own needs and desires and those that challenge our faith from within the world. Forgive us for those times when we have ignored the needs of others and when we have failed to place our feet upon your path, when we allow the earthly voice to distract us from your call. Loving Lord, in your forgiveness, you offer again your invitation to know your love, to be loved, and to respond to your call. In hearing your voice, may we find our place within your creation. Amen. The blazing fire of God's presence refines us, but in mercy, it does not destroy us. God does not repay evil for evil but comes to deliver us and restore us to life. Sisters and brothers, your sins are forgiven. Be at peace. Good morning, peace be with you. I pray school's going really well for you, whether you're back in the school building or you are doing school virtually from your home. When we have our check-ins each week, our virtual check-ins, I always enjoy hearing what's going on in your lives. And one of the things I ask you is to share your joy, your junk, and your Jesus. And the joy is where you or haven't, what's good about your day or your week. Your junk is something that's a bummer about your day or week. And then to share your Jesus is somewhere where you have felt God with you or you've seen God alive around you or in someone else. Maybe someone's being kind to someone or sharing love with someone else. And that's a way that we can see God alive with us. But it's that's the one we always seem to struggle with. It's one that I struggle with too. Because the truth is God is everywhere and with us everywhere. But it's always kind of tricky to train our eyes so that we can see God alive in our friends or in nature. And in our Bible story today, our friend Moses, you may remember Moses from parting the Red Sea or um, setting the Israelites free. But in this story about Moses today, he is a shepherd, an ordinary person, just like us. And he is, um, God's trying to talk to him and he can't hear God. So what God does is God speaks to Moses through a flaming bush. The bush is on fire and God's like, what? Or Moses is wondering what is going on with this bush that is on fire, but isn't burning. And then God starts speaking through a bush kind of like this picture right here. And God tells Moses, I need you to do something huge. And God and Moses finally hears God. God had to speak through a bush, but Moses did hear God. But what we need to do is we need to be able to hear God, whether there's an actual burning bush, but we need to train our ears and our eyes to see and feel God all around us. And God sometimes asks us to do things that may be a little scary 
or we may be nervous about um, and maybe it's going to talk to a friend or a new person at school and that can make us a little nervous but God promised Moses he is always with him and God promises us that same thing too God is with us wherever we are please pray with me good morning God thank you for today help us to see you and hear your voice help us to know you are with us amen our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of exodus exodus chapter 3 verses 1 through 12 but before i read that i invite you to bow your heads and join me in prayer gracious and loving god we come to you now with open hearts hopeful to hear your word we pray by the grace of your spirit that the words we hear and the thoughts of our hearts will lead us to your will for all of us as your church and for each of us as your children. Dear God, we love you. We thank you for your love. Amen. So again, Exodus chapter 3, beginning with the first verse. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. And then he said, Come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you, that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Over the past few years, Julianne and I have had to move around several times. In fact, even since we've moved here to Tallahassee, we've moved three times. We moved from Georgia to Florida down here, then we moved from our apartment to a house, and even at one point we moved from an apartment to another apartment right across the parking lot. And every single time we moved, we had to pack up all of our belongings and, and move them wherever we were going. And we discovered very quickly that we just don't like moving, packing everything up in boxes, lifting heavy things, trying to sort through everything, and then, of course, unpacking them at the end. It's just such a tough, arduous task. But recently, this past week, I was reading a little story by Rabbi Jeffrey Salkin where he had a holy experience while he was moving. He was making small talk with the movers that he hired, and the, and the crew leader of the movers was a, a happy-go-lucky kind of guy, a guy who looked a little bit like Willie Nelson, and he was making small talk as he was moving boxes out of his house, and he asked him, you know, why did you decide to become a mover? The man with a big smile on his face said, well, you know, I'm actually a very religious person, and I feel like this is part of my religious duty to serve other people. I know people who are moving or going through a vulnerable time where they're moving from one place to another, going through a transition, sometimes a little uncertain. And of course, these strangers are packing all of their boxes and moving them out of their house. And so I want to be a helpful person during that time, a comforting presence. I feel like I'm called 
to help them move during that transition. Called to be a mover. That's what the man said. I'm thankful that there are people in the world who feel called to be movers, feel called to be teachers, feel called to be doctors and nurses and all those other things that I'm not good at and that I certainly need in my life. But as Presbyterians, we believe that all of us are called in different ways. We actually believe we're all called as disciples in a general way to live as disciples and to serve Jesus Christ. But we also believe that all of us are called in particular ways based on our gifts and our talents, but also based on the the context in which we live. And our individual churches are called that way too to serve our communities in which we live using the gifts and talents that God has blessed each of us with as congregations. And from time to time, that calling can even change based on what's going on in the world around us and maybe what's going on within our church. During these times that are so uncertain, these times of of struggle, these times when our world seems like it's turned on its head, these are times when I have tried to rethink who we are called to be as Faith Presbyterian Church. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at different call stories to think about who we are called to be during a time such as this. We'll be looking at call stories throughout the Old and the New Testament, hoping to learn a little bit more about what it means to be called and who we are called to be in the face of the uncertainty that we are looking at now. And today we're going to begin with the call of Moses. Now, most of us look at Moses and think that Moses is very different than all of us. He was a hero of our faith, a a great prophet, maybe the greatest prophet of all. And we look at him and read this story, especially this story of the, the burning bush, and we think, boy, Moses is so much different than us. How could we have the faith that Moses had? But when we look a little more critically at the call story of Moses, we realize Moses is a lot like us. You remember the story of Moses. He was a child of a Hebrew slave woman. She put him in the river to, because she didn't want to watch as he suffered and died at the hands of the Egyptians. But in a plot twist of all plot twists, he is found by the daughter of Pharaoh himself and taken up and, and raised in the house of Pharaoh as a prince of Egypt. But as Moses grew up, he learned that he was the son of a Hebrew slave and was a Hebrew person himself. And he once witnessed a a, a taskmaster from the Egyptians beating and harming a Hebrew slave. And he decided he had to intervene and he, he killed that taskmaster. But when that happened, his life changed forever. He knew he was no longer safe in Egypt. And so he fled to a faraway land of Midian where he married his wife Zipporah and became a shepherd for his father-in-law, Jethro. And it was there, then, that our story, our passage, took place. He was tending his sheep on a mountainside when he looked up on that mountain and he saw this bush that looked like it was on fire, but it wasn't being consumed. And as he got a little bit closer, he heard the voice of God cry out to him, Moses, Moses, take off your shoes for you're on holy ground. And this voice of God cried out and said he had heard the people suffering in Egypt, heard the cries of the people asking for help, and that now God had decided it was time to deliver them, and he wanted to send Moses to help deliver them. Now, of course, we hear this call story, and most of us have never experienced anything like a burning bush or, or even a booming voice from the sky. And so we think Moses is very different from us to experience something like that. If, if we had ever experienced something like that, we might follow God wherever God calls us to. But even though we might not see burning bushes around us every single day, those words that God shared with Moses are still words that we hear in our hearts every single day. Anytime we see people around us who are hurting, people in our church and people in our community in need, anytime you witness that need of people suffering around us and you feel that burning in your own heart, that's just like that burning bush. That's that call from God saying, I hear the suffering of my people and I want to deliver them. Anytime a parent sees their child hurting and wants to do something, or when they see other children hurting and and want to be spring into action, that's that call from God saying, I hear the suffering of my people 
and I want to make a change. Or when we have suffered ourselves and we see other people suffering like we have and we want to reach out and try to to care for them and help them through their pain, that's that call from God telling us, I've heard the cries of my people and I want to help them. Anytime we witness a need in the world of any kind and we want to help, that's God calling us just like God called Moses. But just as God calls us and just as God called Moses, there are times in our lives where we don't answer that call as God expects us to or God hopes us to. And that's what Moses did. You would think that Moses would spring into action, pick up his staff, and, and head off to Egypt. But instead, Moses acts, well, a lot like we do sometimes. He had questions, he had fears, and he had doubts when God asked him to serve. He began by really questioning God's logic at all. Why would God send someone like Moses? There were so many other more qualified people out there. People like Pharaoh himself, if he just called Pharaoh to to open up the gates and send the people of Hebrew out of of Egypt, he could save them himself. Or maybe some sort of uh, general in the army who could overthrow overthrow Pharaoh, overthrow those people who were oppressing the Hebrews. But that's not who God called God called Moses. Moses wondered, questioned, who in the world is this God that would be calling someone like me? We sometimes feel that way ourselves. Why would God call someone like me when there's so many other qualified people out there in the world? Barbara Brown Taylor, the great priest and, and theologian, told a great story about how she was sitting on a, uh, an ordination board for her denomination. It was one of the hardest jobs she had trying to decide if these people who were called to ministry actually should be called and ordained by the church. And so she was sitting there going through resumes, going through faith statements, and listening to people come and talk about why they felt like they were called by God. But Most of them, many of them, were were fairly strange people. People who had been through pain, people who had been through divorce, people who had lost their jobs. And they always seemed to want to retreat back into the church to try to find their calling. And she often found it so arduous to, to filter through all of these people. But there was one person she remembered in particular. It was a man uh, who had had been through a lot in his life, and when they asked him how he knew he was called, he lifted up his shirt and he he showed a, a bullet wound, a scar from a bullet that had lodged in his body. And he said, I received this bullet wound when I was trying to rob a convenience store, but that bullet wound was my burning bush. That bullet wound was my calling to change my life and become someone new. Well, the committee got together and talked about him and said, wow, we've never had this before, a a former convict, someone who's trying to reform and change his life. But for some reason, he caught Barbara Brown Taylor's attention. That story that he told about the burning bush meant more to her than any kind of belief that he had changed his life or that they should offer him forgiveness because she knew the truth of the Bible that God called strange people all the time. People like Moses. Moses who was an abandoned baby. Moses who was a murderer. Moses who was a a shepherd attending to someone else's sheep so poor that he didn't even own his own sheep. Someone like Moses could be called by God because those were exactly the kind of people that God called. And if God could call people like that, then of course God could call people like you and me. Moses couldn't believe that God would call someone like him, and yet that's exactly the kind of people that God calls Moses not only questioned God, but he had his own fears too. Fears about how his life would change when this calling came through. If he took advantage of what God had called him to do and tried to change his life and live his life differently, he knew that it would turn his life upside down, that this life that he was living here in Midian, even though it was a poor life, it was a safe life where he could avoid the troubles of Egypt, but now God was calling him back. And he knew this life following the calling of God would be dangerous. It would be different. It would be difficult for him. And maybe we have those same fears 
that Moses had. We fall in our comfort zones. We have our own expectations, our own plans about our life, of how we should live our life, of what we want to achieve. And, and then God calls us, and those plans change. Or if, at least if we accept that calling, those plans change. Will Williman, the great uh, Methodist pastor and former chaplain at Duke Divinity School, tells this wonderful little story about sitting there in the chapel on Parents' Weekend, looking out at all the parents who were, were leaving their kids behind at Duke University. And he remembered how over his years as a chaplain, he had received somewhere around 20 calls from angry parents, calls directly to him about things going on in his, their children's lives. But he said not one of them was a call about their child struggling with alcohol or struggling with drugs or getting into the wrong crowd at school or or even becoming more sexually promiscuous or anything like that. Almost every single one of them was a call from a parent that said, I'm worried that my child has become a religious fanatic. They were supposed to go to Duke and become a doctor, and now they want to go and join the Peace Corps. They were supposed to to major in economics and and really become a a rich person and and support themselves, and we would never have to worry about them. And now they want to go off to Haiti and and serve in some tiny village. They become changed because of this calling, this religious, fanatical calling to serve Jesus Christ. They were calling on Chaplain Williman to to go and convince their children to go back to the former plan, to go back to that comfort zone, to go and and follow the plan that their parents and maybe even they they themselves had set before them. But God had a different plan, that plan that calls us to make ourselves uncomfortable, that plan that calls us to, to step out of our comfort zone, to do something differently, to heed that call to help those people around us in need. Moses had that fear too. He didn't want to change his life to go back and face the old demons that he had faced in Egypt. He wanted to stay right where he was, but God had a different plan. But after all those questions and all of those fears, maybe the biggest obstacle in Moses' way was his doubts about himself. He knew who he was. He knew what he had been through. And he doubted that he could really accomplish what God was calling him to accomplish. To go to Egypt, to face Pharaoh, to lead thousands of people out of Egypt, to lead those Hebrews into freedom. He knew he didn't have that in him. He knew he couldn't do that all by himself. And that's when God gives him and gives us the greatest assurance of all. all. He says, Moses... I will be with you. In fact, you're not doing this at all. I'm doing this. And I'm asking you to be a part of this plan. Sometimes we forget when we're called by God that it's not because we're qualified, it's not because we're best, it's not because we can do what God has asked us to do, but it's because God has invited us to be a part of something greater than we are to be a part of God's plan that is far more deep and meaningful than any kind of plan or any kind of life we could have on our own. I told you this story before, but years ago when I was serving at a previous church, I got to go to Peru to serve on a mission trip, and I was struck by a wonderful pastor about my age that lived there just outside of Lima and served many of the slums outside of that big city. He had started 10 different churches on his own, and those churches had become the center of their little community, a place where doctors would come throughout the week and and help the people in need, and even schools would take place where the children could come through throughout the week, and of course, they would worship there every single week, and he would travel throughout the week to each of those churches and, and offer prayer and offer worship. And as I sat there and listened to him tell this story, he told me through a translator that he was going to start another church in another community not too far away. Well, of course, I asked all of those Moses questions. Well, do you already have the, the land purchased and in place? And of course, he said, no. Do you have money? Do you have donors? How are you going to afford to do this? And he didn't know. I asked him, how is he even going to be able to stretch himself so thin to, to, to go to yet another church and serve yet another congregation? And he didn't know. And so I finally asked that question, how do you think you'll be able to do this? And with a big smile on his face, 
he said something to the translator, but I knew what he said. He said, I'm not going to be doing this. It's God that's doing this. I'm just a part of the play. And if we needed any kind of evidence that God could pull it off, all we had to do was look at the other ten churches that he had already started. God calls each of us, just like God calls Moses. And we have our doubts, we have our questions, we have our fears. And our first reaction, just like Moses, might be to ask all those questions, to hide behind our doubts and to hide behind those fears. But eventually, Moses was convinced, convinced that God's plan was better than his plan. And so he reached down and he picked up his staff and he met his brother Aaron and they headed on to Egypt just as God had called them to do. God's calling us every single day through the people and the needs of this world around us. That's what Frederick Buechner calls a calling. It's where the world's deep need and our deep gladness meet and intersect, where our deepest gladness can address one of the deepest needs of the world. That's what God says. I've heard the cries and the deep needs of the world around us, and I'm ready to answer. And I'm giving you this chance to be a part of that answer. And we can answer as Moses did, or we can answer as faithful people. Instead of asking, why me? We can ask, why not me? Instead of saying, I don't have what it takes, we could say, I have everything God requires. Instead of hiding behind our fears, we can take that leap of faith. Instead of, instead of saying, I don't think I can do this, we can say, I can. I can do anything with God's help. So let us look for God's call and listen for God's call together. To the glory of God. Amen. God calls us every single day to live as disciples, to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves, to give ourselves, all of ourselves, to God's glory and to God's mission. I want to invite you to continue to worship with me now by giving to God yourself, your tithes, your offerings, and your very heart. You can do that as you've done that for the past several months through the, the, our website, faithpcusa.org. give You can go to that Give Plus app, or you can also just drop your gift here at the church, and we will continue to serve God and listen for God's calling as God calls us to serve and to worship. So let's continue to worship now by bringing to God God's tithes and our offerings. Unseen 
and admit to what I mean in you and you in me. Will you love the you you hide if I but call your name? Will you quell the fear inside and never be the same? Will you use the faith you found to reshape the world around through my sight and touch and sound in you? Lord, your summons echoes through in you, but call my name. Let me turn and follow you and never be the same. In your company I'll go where your love and footsteps show. Thus I'll move and live and grow. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Lord of all mercy and compassion, bless these gifts lovingly offered and all the people here. Help us to use these gifts for ministries of hope through our church and into our community, nation, and world. Amen. Please join me for the prayers of the people. Listening God, you heard the prayers of the Israelites. Hear now these prayers, both spoken and silent. We pray for peace where there is conflict. For food where there is hunger. For hope where there is despair. For health where there is sickness. For faith where there is fear. For life where there is death. As you called Moses, call to each of us again. Give us courage that removes self-doubt so that we can embody your word to a world in need. We pray in the name of Jesus, who conquers all that would defeat us. The name of the one who gives us new life. Using the words he taught us, we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
God's calling this week, I invite you to do five things. Live simply, love generously, serve faithfully, speak truthfully, pray daily, leave everything else to God. And may God's grace, mercy, and peace live within you, surround you, and make you whole, now and forever. Amen.